everybody, and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I'm Taylor Rockwell. With me, via the magic of the internet tubes, I've got a man whose automobiles are working as well as VAR in the Premier League. It's Ryan Bailey. Hello, Ryan. Greetings, Tay-Tay. How are you today? As, as you mentioned there, I, I have been having some automotive troubles. In the past month, I've been to the shop, as you Americans call it, seven times. Seven times. <laughs> Seven and and how, how are you when it comes to mechanical issues? Are you having to make the noises, or can you explain, or do you have one of the fancy pants computer uh, cars that tells you everything that's wrong? Uh, YouTube is my friend. I tend to try and have some knowledge when I go in there, but it's just, oh, like I was in there for three hours today for something that should have taken 10 minutes, and I don't want to get into it. I, this is a day of celebration, Tate. It's the day, uh, the first day of school for my, for my kids, <laughs> aka the first day of peaceful home office environment. So I'm in a Zen place today. I'm not going to let Hyundai's customer service let me down. Is, is that how your people pronounce that word, Hyundai? So when I first came here and I started doing Kick TV, and I, that we were talking about um, uh, a- a- Asian soccer, and I was, I was talking about like Hi- the team, Hyundai, and they stopped the camera. They were like, no, no, it's Hyundai. I was like, no, it's Hyundai. And I had to play them commercials from the UK where we call it Hyundai. This is, this is an ongoing debate between myself and Daryl Grove, because you all, you all have your pronunciations that are sometimes correct and then sometimes wildly incorrect. And it's really difficult to know which one. Like, I still don't know. Is it Jaguar or is it Jaguar? And I feel Jaguar, like you all make it. It's it's which one? It's got you, you kind of force an extra syllable out of it. It's Jaguar. Okay. Well, you call me darling, so I feel like I'm just going to agree with you on that one. But did you at least get free coffee in the Today Show while you were sitting in the uh, in the automotive waiting room? Oh, the coffee machine was broken, and it was international <laughs> CNN. Oh no! All right, that's double O no. Well, let's move on to. It was Formula E racing, Taylor. <laughs> For two hours, I had to watch Formula E racing commentary on international CNN. Why right, we are... two hours of it? Why? We are gonna, we are going to talk about soccer eventually, but I, now I have to know what is Formula E. Like I know it's... Formula One. So Formula One obviously is the the motor racing. Formula mm. E is the electric version, which no one cares about, or less fewer people cares about. I'm sorry, Formula E fans. All right, so it's not like like esports. It's not like like people playing a racing game. It's like electric cars racing. It's actual sporting competition, okay. but there is no uh, petroleum distillate involved in the automobiles. All right. Well, not speaking of petroleum distillate, uh, let's talk uh, some action from this weekend. Let's start Woo. with what appears to be the talking point of every weekend, at least in the Premier League. Let's talk VAR because. Uh, I, think, I think that's specifically the reason why Daryl isn't on the Monday show, so he gets to avoid <laughs> talking about VAR, because it does seem like, it felt to me like it was going to be a thing where, like, okay, they're making an effort to explain why it's being used and how it's being used. The the Match of the Day pundits, the other pundits I've seen are all sort of, seem to be in favor of it, seem to be kind of touting its blessings. And this was the weekend where I really felt like it got harder and harder for them to do that, because we had at least four different games that had... Uh, that were strongly impacted, or at least somewhat impacted, by VAR. Uh, Ryan, was was this the same for you, or are, are you still sort of feeling the same about VAR as you ever were? I'm, I'm feeling like the waters are further muddying every mm-hmm. week we go into this Premier League use of VAR. And I have to say, I think the real difference maker with the way the VAR is applying it and other leagues and, and tournaments have done is the not looking at the screen. Agreed. Um, because... I suppose the point they're making is the referee on the field has the final say on all decisions, which is the way it's always been. And say for the David Silver incident, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you can you can see how that's a, a clear foul when you look mm-hmm. at it in VR review. It's quite clear that there's no question that's a penalty. But because the referee's seen it, he's made up his mind, doesn't want to go and look at the screen. There's no he's not getting the backup that he should get. Is if that makes sense? They're they're doing this to, to save time. But it's just making it worse. It's making it's sort of putting a crutch on VAR, if that makes sense. It, it does, and I completely agree. We had a question about that from John Kenny, uh, who asked if the penalty on David Silva in the 61st minute isn't clear and obvious, then what is even the point of VAR? Mm. Uh, City fans, especially, right to feel hard done by after the Rodri tackle last week or the Rodri headlock. Uh, yeah, I think somebody on Reddit pointed out that it's now VAR for City nil because City <laughs> have yet to get a VAR decision. But but I do agree with John that uh, the David Silva one was very clear in my mind. And did seem like one that if the referee had gone back and looked at the screen, it would have been a different story. And I and I totally agree with you, Ryan. Uh, yeah. I think Andrew Guyanis is how I'm going to pronounce that one. Apologies, Andrew, if I got it wrong. Who is a Manchester United fan? Full uh, disclosure there. Uh, 
who says, Premier League VAR interpretation question, uh, disclaimer, I'm a United fan. The commentators made some reference to Martial penalty bid as having as VAR having to overrule the referee's decision on the field. Is there going to be subjectivity in the way VAR is interpreted in the Premier League if the language uh, is that it has to overrule the referee's decision? And I think this is what you were getting to as well, Ryan, that between not going to have a look at it and then basically VAR not necessarily having the authority to say like either, hey, you have to go look at this or, hey, your call was wrong. You need to reverse it. Mm-hmm. It ends up being with the official. And I think a lot of times the official, if they're not going to go look at it, they don't want to waste the time. They think, yeah, I saw that. It wasn't a foul. Yeah, I saw that it was a foul. Let's let's keep the game moving. This doesn't matter. And it sort of loses the intent of VAR. And then it basically ends up just getting used for potential red card stamps, which is what it seems to be like stopped every now and then to police or like minute offside decisions. And I don't think yeah. it's VAR's fault necessarily, but I think it's the way the Premier League is choosing to use VAR that is causing problems. Yeah, that's definitely right. I mean, the whole point of VAR is to, you know, is to give us or as close as we can get to a black and white decision, a yes or no, to take out the element of human error. And by not um, by sort of not letting the refs uh, look at the screens or whatever, we're sort of introducing that layer of subjectivity and keeping that layer of, of human error in there. So it does seem like if you're going to do it, you should do it. And they're not really using it to its full potential. They're kind of making the integrity of the whole VAR system suffer a little bit, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Like, And that's what I find so frustrating is I, I do like VAR. I've talked about it before that I like having that secondary, like there's not going to be any sort of cheap calls. Nothing is going to get missed. We're going to know for sure. And now I... I can't believe that we're in a situation where I feel like we know less than we did before. That, um, like, I, at least three different incidents. Uh, Ryan, I'll ask you for your thoughts on them. But like, there were three incidents this weekend that I felt like were stone cold penalties that VAR should have shown to be penalties, and I think mm. the replays did, and then they weren't given as penalties. I want to make sure that you agree, and if not, then maybe that helps me feel better. But uh, Man City v. Bournemouth, we already talked about Jefferson Lerma steps on David Silva's foot in the box. If you've yeah. only seen the replay, or like the the quick little gif of this, I want to note it's a little confusing because it looks like the contact happens outside the box, and then David Silva falls inside the box. The line that you're seeing there is the six-yard box, not the 18-yard box. <laughs> yes. So he's absolute. It did take me a minute when I saw that replay to be like, wait, but why would that be? He definitely gets stepped on. A, oh, oh, he was eight yards from goal. You know, that's definitely a penalty. <laughs> but again, VA review, uh, the official doesn't take a look. No penalty given. Ryan, for you, is this a penalty? It was one of those ones when I was watching it live and I was like, I saw him go down. I was like, get up. That's not a foul. And then you saw the replay. You're like, that's definitely a foul. Yep. And I, now, now I see why they use these replays. Yeah, all right. So you're saying definitely a foul there. Uh, yeah. Norwich v. Chelsea, uh, Aspilicueta kicked in the box by, I believe it was Marco Schnieperman. Uh, again, I, I don't even know if there was a review this time, but no penalty given. To me, Aspilicueta kicked. It disrupts his running motion is the best way I can explain it. He goes down. To me, that's a penalty. Ryan, how say you? I think it's probably the weakest of the claims of the okay. weekend, but still a pen, I'd say. W- why do you say weakest? Not that I disagree. I'm just curious. So, I just feel like the other three are, that we're, we're going to okay. discuss are more nailed on. I, I can't quite... Uh, All right. What, what, what would the other ones be? So we've talked about David Silva. We've talked about um, Aspilicueta. What's another obvious one for you? Well, the other big one, I, I suppose, was the, uh, uh, the Spurs Newcastle mm-hmm. with Harry Kane going down. Lascelles yep. kind of it was a weird challenge, wasn't it? It wasn't. Yep. It wasn't like a, a, a definite lunge with a foot or whatever, but it still felt like it was a definite impediment to Harry Kane, and wasn't even checked. Right. No. I think it was VA reviewed. Mike Dean did not check. Uh, Mike Dean, the, oh. the official for this one, did not go over and check. It's all about Mike Dean, isn't it? Oh, jeez. I mean, I think that doesn't help that if you have officials, and I genuinely mean that, like, even if it's kind of silly, that, like, if you have referees who have perceived bias towards or against a team, and then they're not reviewing it themselves, even if that's become their sort of standard practice, regardless of the team's playing, it still looks like, oh, Mike Dean, he hates Spurs. If you're a Spurs fan, he hates Spurs. And now he won't even go look at this review. Like, oh, of course he won't. And and again, it doesn't help clarify. It helps make people more frustrated by the situation. Because for me, it's not a tackle. It looks like Lascelles like accidentally kind of falls over, but he still like essentially dives into the plant foot of Harry Kane. Does Harry yeah. Kane leave it? Does he kind of invite the contact? It's it's tough to say, but I'm inclined to say that. It looks like Lascelles takes out his footing, knocks him onto the ground. To me, that should have been a penalty as well, but it wasn't because it wasn't checked by the official. Yeah, I agree. Even even if it was an accidental tumbling over, he still brings down the attacker. To me, that still means it's an impediment and it's a penalty. And the, the other game we should talk about, obviously, yeah. is Man United Palace. 
Um, the, the, there were a few here, but the big one, I suppose, was Anthony Martial being yeah. brought down by, was it Martin Kelly, I think? Um, I can't remember, I think my, if it was Kelly or Cahill. One of them, and uh, <laughs> definitely one of them. And uh, no, no penalty given, no. I mean... I don't even know how to start with that one because, like, you could the, it, it was. It just seems so obvious that it was. And yeah. why was there no? Why was nothing done about that one? I can't all, understand that one. All I can figure is that, like, the other thing that factors into this, at least I think from a fan perspective, when it comes to the confusion, is that there are so many conflicting iterations of the rules out there that it's tough mm-hmm. to find the exact current one. And I say that because, as far as I understand, the new rule change is that if there's contact outside of the box that continues into the box, then you award the penalty uh, like f- if you're going to give the foul. And so all I can think there is maybe the official decides, oh, there's maybe some contact out of the box. Martial goes down too easily. Uh, so between those two, I'm not giving the penalty. But it, it goes back to then, this to me is, and uh, you know, full disclosure, Man United fan, not trying to like like cover that up or anything like that. And, and if I'm biased here, Ryan, I, I invite you to tell me otherwise. Um, but to me, it just felt like that's one where if you take a look at that, there's definitely contact. It continues into the box. It disrupts the running motion. Uh, Marcio gets pulled back as he's trying to shoot. All of those to me say penalty, but in the end, it's not given. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think you're being too biased there. I think that's okay. quite a fair assessment. And, and so like, I, I do hope, I, I don't, I guess I don't fully know how this gets better, which is maybe where we should take it instead of just saying like, yep, it was wrong, it was wrong, it was wrong, which I've led us down that path. But more <laughs> to the point of like, I don't know if this is a thing that the Premier League tries to change mid season or if this is a thing that we're going to have to adapt to. But for a technology that was supposed to clarify things and punish clear and obvious errors or correct clear and obvious errors, it doesn't seem to be doing that anymore. And I'm not entirely certain how the Premier League is going to change that mid-season yeah it's making things less clear and not so obvious <laughs> which i guess is maybe what they're going for it keeps interest and it keeps uh, everybody angry so maybe at least it's accomplishing a job there yeah do you think it's like a politician how they distract from the real issue and they uh they they, they introduce something <laughs> on the side maybe var is the premier league are distracting us from something maybe they're i don't know we, I think the, the 39th game is what's about to happen, I feel like. They're going to oh, bring God. that one back up now, which, which won't have like AR. They've been slaughtering polar bears or something, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you're closer. I mean, that I wouldn't put it past them. That does feel like the thing that an evildoer in, in a movie would do, and since the Premier League is all you know, like, like men in suits who all look very severe and evil, I feel like that's a possibility, Ryan. All right, so until we find out that the Premier League is not uh, murdering polar bears for no uh, real reason, we're just going to accept that as truth. Does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. Uh, well, then we should move uh, swiftly on to a game that had less VAR controversy. Uh, not no VAR controversy, but uh, minimal. Uh, Liverpool 3, Arsenal 1. Uh, Daniel McC- McCurry asks, did any serious person think Arsenal had any chance to pick up points at Anfield this week? Uh, well, I, don't, I wouldn't class myself as a serious person, but no, I think is the answer there because we know what their record's like at Anfield. Uh, this stat mm. uh, from this one, they've got a terrible record against um, Big Six teams away yep. as well. Their last 23 away games against Big Six, they haven't won a single one. Eight draws, 15 losses, 53 goals conceded, one clean sheet. So we should have seen this one coming, but... Also, this is this is you know a, a very worthy box office game to watch this weekend because you know this one's going to have goals because mm. I think in the I look back at the stats and going back to 1999, there's only been one goalless draw between these two, so lots of uh, lots of action in this game always, and I think it delivered. It was a pretty interesting game to watch, wasn't it? It was indeed, and I think when you combine the front three of Liverpool, the high press and like intensity of Liverpool. And then David Luiz playing defense for Arsenal. I think, yeah, you're, you're correct in assuming that there will be goals. And that was my big thing heading into this game is uh, Daryl and I had a disagreement about this. His point was that uh, David Luiz is better than Mustafi, so it's definitely an upgrade to have him in there. I was less... Uh, convinced by that one, and I think it only took two games for David Luiz to make me feel justified in my concern, I think make Arsenal fans a little bit nervous. Do you think they should be, or is this just sort of the David Luiz one-off moment of madness, and then he gets back to it? Uh, two, two off, at least in this one, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he gave up two goals, basically. In Good this answer. 
Um, I think I think Dave, uh, David Lewis gets a, a difficult rap because he is. Mm. I mean, for a lot of this game, he was good. He had good positioning and so on. But it's, it is those aforementioned moments of madness where he lets himself down. I think he's a good defender for most Premier League teams, but maybe not the right one for Arsenal because I think you need a more fortified backline to support his antics in general. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, no arguments here. No arguments here. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, you go in, you go in. I think it's it's the thing that I find so frustrating about him is he has these moments where he is, if not like unplayable, then he's very good in the air. He like rises to the physical challenge and, and meets it and then can obviously contribute in the attack. But then you have these moments... Um, for people who haven't seen it or aren't aware, the first Liverpool goal comes from a penalty. David Luiz basically pulls back Mohamed Salah in the box. I would say that that's a foolish thing to do because of VAR, but then again, given the conversation we've already had, maybe VAR would have let that one go. Referee catches it, though, and a penalty for Liverpool. Mohamed Salah scores it. But to, but be, I'll- fair, to be fair, Taylor, David Luiz, as soon as he pulls the shirt, he lifts his hand up as if to say he was innocent, <laughs> therefore <laughs> admonishing himself of any blame at all. I, I often I often think about like playing amateur soccer and how often I am convinced that I am correct. Like I definitely didn't do that. That was definitely a foul or whatever. And how if there were thirty different cameras pointed at me, how ludicrous that would look in retrospect to just like have visual evidence right away that like no, you're completely wrong. And this is that moment I think for David Luiz of maybe forgetting that there are cameras all around and protesting his innocence, even while we could all see that he very obviously concedes this penalty. Maybe he doesn't realize these games are broadcast. That, maybe, maybe that's that. the, maybe that's the issue. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, like he could be forgiven for thinking that with PSG, but I think with the Arsenal, you're definitely going to have those on TV. Uh, <laughs> but but then, but I also think this this matters more because in that moment of sort of like, oh, I'm just going to pull him back really fast. It won't matter. Penalty conceded. It's also picking up that yellow card, and I think that informs the second mistake David Luiz makes for uh, Mohamed Salah's uh, second goal, uh, Liverpool's third. Um, Basically, it's it's what Arsenal playing a high line. I think David Luiz realizes yeah. he's going to be beaten to the ball, and also realizes that if he makes any contact or makes any sort of connection with Mohamed Salah, that he's probably going to knock him over, and it's going to be a second yellow, and it's going to be a red card. And so instead, he has to kind of sweep the leg, but also pull out of it at the same time, and ends up making mm. zero defensive play on this ball. And I think that's the one where it sort of is like David Luiz's frustrating past actions end up catching up to him in this game. And I think that is probably why Arsenal fans might be a little bit frustrated by it. That said, it's only two games for him so far. Uh, And, you know, I mean, 50% uh, success rate for David Luiz is a decent rate, uh, in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, sure. And once again, you have to note that he did put his hands up in the air when Salah went past him. He, You know, he's basically saying, lads, I've done all I can here. This is on you now. (laughs) I mean... I think that's fair. That's the best approach to take uh, when, when you're trying to get out of a hot situation. <laughs> Daryl and I are going to talk a little bit, I think, on uh, tomorrow's show, Tuesday show, about some of the tactics in this game. So if you're looking more for like a tactical review of what Arsenal got wrong or Liverpool got right, I think that'll be discussed there. But I would just emphasize that when you're playing against a high-pressed team that didn't sign anybody in the offseason because they're such a unified squad. Uh, experimenting with playing out of the back and like really st- staying true to just playing out of the back is maybe not the best idea, Arsenal. That's my kind of game summary on this one. Yeah, and if I were to give a cliff notes, I would say to uh, you know Emery, maybe make some kind of change at some point in the game. <laughs> you, you think? Know. Is that a good and- idea? Try and do something different if you're mm. losing. If you've, got, if you've let in three goals uh, after an hour, maybe... Switch things up. Don't just make like like substitutions. I don't know. And I, you know, there's lots of arguments you can make about maybe they should have made a back three, but then you're you're basically going three for three with the Liverpool front three, which is a difficult thing to do. But I, I would at least have maybe considered doing some managing at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll suggest that to Unai Emery, uh, maybe consider doing some managing. Meanwhile, uh, congratulations to Liverpool fans who can continue yeah. to enjoy I, uh, um, their lovely attacking team. But I also add, though, that Arsenal could have gone ahead. They had a few good chances, but it was just like the finishing let them down, didn't it? I think Pepe and Aubameyang both yeah. had one-on-ones. I think maybe maybe even mm-hmm. Aubameyang had two one-on-ones, so I think one was offside perhaps. But they just didn't take the chances. And no. It could have been a completely different game had they have taken those chances. Yeah, the Pepe one especially, like not even necessarily like highlighting that he should have scored in Obama Yang's was more difficult, more so that mm-hmm. it felt like he decides to try to nutmeg the goalkeeper there. Yeah. And and I think that was probably the mistake because putting it to either side, just kind of passing it in, 
always seems the better option than, oh, the goalkeeper's going to dive or jump at me, so I'll wait and try to pass it through the legs. It did seem like he was trying to evaluate that, shows that option, but then you end up passing it straight at the goalkeeper who can easily just kick the ball away. That was that was a pretty <laughs> bad miss, and there can be those moments when you're so sure you're going to score, everything's going right, and then the player doesn't, and it can have that knock-on effect of, uh, maybe this isn't our game, and it just starts yeah. to sow those seeds of doubt. Uh, and Aubameyang also had the, uh, the opportunity to punish Adrian for that very poor clear that yeah. he put wide from that little a lob attempt, which probably for a player of his talent could have done better. Yes. So maybe uh, Arsenal fans not feeling as confident, Liverpool, Liverpool fans certainly feeling confident, but you, our dear listener, can feel very confident when you utilize today's sponsor uh, because today's episode is brought to you by SeatGeek, the ticket company where the customer comes first. They have over 50,000 five-star reviews in the App Store, and they're focused on making your ticket buying experience as easy as possible. How do they do that, Ryan? How do they make buying tickets so, so very easy? Won't you let me explain? I and will. It pulls in millions of tickets from all over the web. It rates each deal on a scale of one to ten, and it very cleverly displays them on an interactive seat map on your desktop or on your phone, wherever you're looking. And it's very easy. Green dots mean it's a good deal. Red dots, not so much of a good deal. So I really like this system, and it's very easy to find uh, good tickets for the concert you're after. Would you like to know the latest concert I've been to? Because I, I, I seem to just review concerts whenever I come on this show now. I went to see Queen on Friday night. Ooh. Oh, who, who's fronting Queen now? Queen plus Adam Lambert. Okay. I discovered it's Lambert and not Lambert, which sounds more fancy to me. I mean, I think um, Freddie Mercury would want it to be Lambert, but Lambert's fine. Yeah, absolutely. And I was very reticent. I'm a huge Queen fan since I was very small, and I haven't seen them in their current post Freddie guys at all, and I just took a chance on this one, and it was absolutely brilliant. I would say it was almost like a Broadway show, because he's really? very brought by Adam Lambert. They had a great production. Obviously, the songs were all bangers. To see Brian May playing Red Special, the guitar he made from a piece of wood from his fireplace, uh, to see him do that live was just absolutely wonderful. And, uh, you know, they're still on tour. I think they've got some dates. Oh, no. That was the last night of the U.S. tour. You're not going to see Queen if you go on Seat Geek anymore. Oh, but I have, I have two questions about, about Queen since, since you brought it up here. First yeah. off, uh, is it Brian May? Is he the one who's like also a physicist or like some sort of like genius who also happens to play guitar really, really, really well? Yes, he has a PhD, I think, in there some kind of astro- astro- astrological uh, uh, um, um, discipline, yes. And then also building his own instruments. And two, um, like, is there any acknowledgement that like Adam Lambert Lambert is not uh, uh, Freddie Mercury? Like, Obviously, they're not trying to trick you, but is there sort of a like, hey, not trying to fill his shoes, but uh, just doing my best cover or something like that? That was, that was actually one of the best things about it, because he, he acknowledged like, a few sets in, he did a little speech, uh, uh, through songs in, I should say, he did a little speech about, I'm a fan just like you uh isn't it great having these two legends on stage let's just try and have a good time tonight it was basically he despite being someone who looks like he's got a big ego and is flamboyant and does he had four costume changes um he didn't make it about him he he presented it as he's being a fan he was just like presenting the songs to us and there was there are points where freddie mercury um was used on screen his voice was used like there's a song called love of my life which brian may did or, or acoustically and the last verse was done by freddie on a stage uh, on, a, on a screen, sorry. It was very cleverly done. And I, I just thought the whole thing was a, a thumbs up from me. <laughs> well, uh, thumbs up from you, thumbs up to SeatGeek, because uh, as Ryan said, their like, US tour is over. I'm assuming Queen will be back on tour, especially if Adam Lambert Lambert uh, d- continues to do a good job. So you can. They, uh, are, um, they are heading to Asia. So if you, want, if you really fancy a trip to Asia, and you can you probably go. get those tickets on SeatGeek. But <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> um, I, I, maybe they, they should cover plane tickets to the venue. That, that should be their next updated version of SeatGeek, is get uh, plane tickets for $10 off to the venue where you can then get $10 off the uh, event itself. That's that's my pitch to them. I'm guessing they won't take it. Uh, but if you <laughs> want to see any other live performance, uh, could be a comedy show, could be a concert, could be a sporting event, could be theater, um, you can do so. And SeatGeek uh, helps our listeners get $10 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Ryan, how do they do that? They do that by using the promo code TSS, and that gets you $10 off on your first purchase, as T- T-Rock said there. T-Rock, I'm going with T-Rock that time. I like Not it. That's fine. Yeah. I'll take uh, T-Rock. No, the- Promo code on SeatGeek TSS, which stands for Total Silly Show. Is that right? That's the one. That is the one exactly. Thank you for that. That's promo code TSS for $10 off your first uh, SeatGeek purchase. You can use that for concert tickets, sports, comedy, whatever you want. And it can be, as Ryan seems to utilize it, to see every single musical performance that comes within a 100-mile radius. Is that basically your approach to uh, concert going? That's my MO, yes, correct. 
That's pretty awesome. I, I do appreciate that. It is genuinely motivational that I feel like every time I talk to you, you have seen a new uh, live musical performance. It makes me want to go out and do the same. It's so thank time, you for that, that, Ryan. It's that time of year because where, where I'm from, I, I used to go to a lot of concerts at home, but they were all indoors. They used to be smoky back in the day and, you know, a bit sweaty and gross. Whereas here, you get summer concerts on a lawn and you can sit outside and have a really big light beer for $23. It's wonderful. <laughs> At least it's a big light beer. At least it's not a small light beer oh, for twenty three dollars. You know, do they call them tall boys? The really obnoxiously big. Oh yeah, cash? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just too well, much for one portion. Well, if you drink a like a uh, high percentage alcohol tall boy, maybe uh, the Man United Crystal Palace game will be slightly more palatable if you're a Manchester United fan. Uh, because uh, Manchester United obviously losing at home to Crystal Palace two to one. As I said earlier, I'm slightly biased as a Manchester United fan. Ryan, I'm wondering, you've kind of already answered this part. Were the VAR decisions against United poor, in your opinion? Yeah, definitely the Martial one. I mean, there was one against Rashford and Nilsson. Uh, well, Daniel James got a booking, mm-hmm. didn't he? For, that's, how that's do you feel about one, that yeah. booking? What that that one really frustrated me. That felt like a sort of... Uh, I guess Boy Who Cried Wolf, for lack of a better way of explaining it, that he gets the yellow for diving uh, on his debut, I believe it was, or at least against Wolves. It was one or the other. Um, so here it looks maybe like he's he is taking a dive. He gets the yellow. But replay shows obvious contact. And uh, that's not necessarily a var a bull offense, but mm. more so that maybe the referee just thinks, yeah, you've done this before, so you're probably doing it again. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 I'm very impressed with Daniel James in general, though. He does, mm. he does seem to have that in his game, but... Scored a, scored a nice little goal, didn't he? He certainly did. Him. Which, do you which, think he's, is he starting 11 for, for the foreseeable, do you think? I, I mean, if he has that impact and that does seem to be the way Ole Gunnar Solskjaer likes to manage is players who are in form and have the kind of confident swagger that he came to expect when he was playing for Manchester United, it seems like mm-hmm. that's what he is looking for in his players. But I think he's also not entirely certain what he's looking for, which is why you're seeing some of the rotation and some of the kind of insistence on playing people in areas that don't necessarily work. Uh, and I think that was part of the problem this weekend. And I, and that's where yeah. I kind of am a little bit conflicted because there's so much to be talked about when it comes to the VR decisions and were they right, were they wrong, should it have been different, uh, how hard done were Manchester United. Somebody on Reddit, uh, the Man United Reddit, like broke down like 36 different times that calls went against Man United. That's a bit much for me, but I am wondering, like, this would be like the headline of the weekend is probably Manchester United dropping points to Crystal Palace. It's it's yeah. a big it's a big loss at home. My question for you, Ryan, is like with the calls going the way they did VAR being the talking point, does that change the way this game should be perceived from supporters? As in, was it a bad game with a bad result or was it a bad result that should have been different uh, because, but VAR and maybe Marcus Rashford missing a penalty ruined it. I feel perhaps VAR in this instance might be a bit of a misnomer because okay. this, this is a game that United should have wrapped up regardless. They, they had 18 mm-hmm. shots to Palace's two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they scored two goals. I think it's a, uh, you know, the, the, but Palace basically gave the blueprint. I feel of how how to beat a big six team here. You know, they they got they caught them on the break. They they had a well organized defense that Man United struggled to get through. And you could say that for for Newcastle this weekend as well. Mm-hmm. And can can I ask you? Give me an insight into the way you're watching this game. Okay, mm-hmm. it's the 89th minute. Pogba wins the ball in midfield. It's got that nice one two. Daniel James with the the aforementioned Daniel James, lovely little finish. You know, 89th minute, Old Trafford. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, mm. what are you thinking? You're thinking, well, there's going to be another goal in this game, aren't you? There's going to be another goal. It's going to be just like 1998. <laughs> and then, and then, was that what you were expecting? What happened thereafter? Uh, not that, for sure. But probably <laughs> also not what you thought. I think with the way things have been and my sort of... Uh, concern about the state of the team and maybe Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's managerial abilities. Uh, one-to-one, I was pretty happy with at that point. Given the way things had been and it felt like the United were never going to find a way through, uh, again, speaking as a fan, that goal for me was like, okay, great. They found a way. They equalized. This could be the start of something. And then, and it's worth noting here, and like, I don't want to go down the Paul Pogba is a problem rabbit hole, but I will note that like, this goal comes from Pogba losing the ball, getting it back, then keeping play going, and then eventually Daniel James scores. Right. But basically, he does the exact same thing for Crystal Palace's winner, that he is too slow on the ball, takes too heavy of a touch, gets dispossessed, Crystal Palace go down, other players are involved, don't get me wrong, but that it's Pogba twice being dispossessed, I think, is sort of why I felt a bit more like, 
Daniel James scoring was exciting and great, but also not necessarily a product of Manchester United changing things to be more productive or to make something happen, but more so in that one moment he pulled off something spectacular and Pogba yeah. wasn't punished for his mistake, whereas for Crystal Palace's winner, they were. Well, he was extra punished because he lost the ball to Ben Teke as well, which is... Oh, God. Yeah, I saw, I saw somebody writing up a match report on that one talking about, like, the fresh legs of Christian Ben Teke, and I laughed <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> But also, it was pretty pretty bad defending. I mm-hmm. thought on, on on United's part, they weren't exactly out. It was a break, but they weren't outnumbered. I think mm-hmm. it was sort of three three on five. Uh, everyone was on Wilf, and no one at all on Van Anholt following up behind him for the deflection. It, it, and, it just seemed a bit naive, didn't it? it? It absolutely did. And I think this is where, like, because teams like like sitting deep, especially after getting a one 0 lead and defending and looking to counter, that's not necessarily anything new. But I think it's really difficult to pull off, and that Palace were able to pull it off successfully. Credit to them already. So I take your point about it maybe being a little bit of the formula. But I think adding into that, having a player like Wilfred Zaha, who is so electrifying and does occupy the concerns of so many defenders. That definitely helps as well, because then if you're overly focused on him and what's going to happen and, and the idea of, like, if we shut him down, then Palace have nothing. But if that's all you're focused on, all those other little cracks open up. And if you're 105% focused on Wilfred Zaha, which is not mathematically possible, but you take my point, it, it does to me feel like automatically when it's not Wilf Zaha, you're going to think, oh, okay, I don't need to be quite as on my game, like, because I'm mostly focused on where is he. And if you're not quite as focused on the player in front of you, which maybe in this case is Jordan Ayew, or mm-hmm. maybe is Patrick Van Onholt, then you see what happens in the end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, full credit to Palace for this one. It, mm-hmm. it, it was, I think Rebecca Lowe referred to it as a smash and grab on NBC, which it kind of was. And it's kind of similar to what they did to City last season when they mm-hmm. got that unexpected win as well. You know, it was just all about frustrating them. It was all about being very well organized in defense, uh, tr- turning over possession a lot in midfield, it seemed to be, was a big mm-hmm. a big part of, the, part of it. And obviously hitting them on the break as well. And full credit to them. I think they kind of they kind of figured out the formula a little bit, didn't they? They did indeed. So full credit to Crystal Palace and I suppose to Roy Hodgson as well and to Christian Benteke's fresh legs. Full credit to <laughs> uh, a team you already mentioned previously, Newcastle, getting a 1-0 win on the road against Tottenham. We've already mm-hmm. talked about the LaSalle's incident. Probably should have been a penalty. Uh, we can talk a little bit about Newcastle's goal because I really enjoyed uh, like just the little like faint of a, of a chip pass that completely pulls out Davidson Sanchez and then Jolinton is wide open to finish well. And it's similar to Crystal Palace that you give them that one opportunity they take it they score but it also felt to me like this was representative of a Tottenham team who are definitely struggling with some things behind the scenes uh I think Lyle Ballesteros agrees uh uh Lyle asked why isn't Pochettino starting Vertonghen or Eriksson uh this is me Taylor chiming in to say I think this would have made a big difference if they, he had had a starting center back who maybe doesn't bite on that pump fake and then had had his best attacker in my opinion who can come in and really control the kind of uh, uh, overall flow of the attack. Yeah, for sure. It was. It's, I mean, it's not a full strength Tottenham team by any means. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got people like Lacelso and and Dumbele yeah. and obviously Eriksson on the, not starting, and there's obviously fitness issues and injury issues there. But it does seem, as you say, like there are problems at this team, and it mm-hmm. probably comes from the top. Pochettino's not made any uh, any. He's not tried to hide his fact that he's a bit frustrated. He's, it was the same story last mm-hmm. season, I suppose. But I wonder if that's rubbing off a little bit on this team because it was just pretty uninspiring stuff wasn't it and once again full credit to the opposition for, yep. for exploiting it and for to steve bruce tactical mastermind for uh, changing up his system and, and uh getting it. it was like a he did five at the back was like yep. three four three but five four one as well wasn't it for a lot of time frustrating tottenham a lot and yeah, i think it was a five four zero one but yes i take your point <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah and i think the quote from the guardian um match report was they simply couldn't turn possession into penetration uh, uh, tottenham couldn't so that, that i think that's mm-hmm. a very key point here and pochettino and can- pochettino just to jump in for a moment agrees i think he added something like when we have as much possession as we have and we can't turn that into shots and goals then there's a problem yeah definitely and um, can, can we talk just just to go back to the joe linton goal mm-hmm. One of those people that I'd, I'd written off after two weeks. He was in my FPL draft team. Uh, I, told, I told Daryl that he had a bad name. <laughs> I was like, I was like, that's that. No one named Joel Linton is going to strike fear into the hearts of opponents. Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> well, I'm not sure he still will because 
that goal, like the touch he took before he got it, how did he get away with that touch? It was like I mean, yeah, went, there's that. <laughs> it's not great. Like Ten yards away from him after his first <laughs> touch, it's like in the area. How did he get away with that kind of touch? But he obviously wrong footed. Uh, it, was, it was was it Danny Rose who couldn't quite get in on him? And uh, uh, I yeah, I, th- I think so. I think so. It was it was <laughs> it was not great, but it was definitely a very strange uh, first touch there. But he ends up being able to score again because he passes it past the goalkeeper as opposed to trying to nutmeg the goalkeeper. I should add, uh, I couldn't remember who it was before. It was Christian Atsu who has yeah. the great little like like feint and then the uh, the deft chip into space. So well done, Christian Atsu. Less so Davinson Sanchez and maybe less so Joel Linton, although he ends up scoring, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, are we going to hail Steve Bruce as the tactical genius that he deserves to be? I mean, I, I think maybe this is too much, but like if we're giving credit to Ray Hodgson and Crystal Palace for basically being very defensively disciplined and punishing a superior opponent, when it comes to finances and I would say talent. Yeah, mm-hmm. you kind of have to that he found a way to kind of solidify things at a time when like you could have told me heading into this match that like not only do Newcastle not win this game, but they won't win their first game for three months. And I would have been like, yeah, that sounds about right. And yeah, so I think that, we had a discussion similarly yeah. last week when we, we read out their mm-hmm. upcoming fixtures. Like, they're not getting any points out of those, nope. and proven was wrong already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. So I will give a lot of credit to Steve Bruce. I do think, going back to Lyle's question for a moment, that Pochettino and the state of Spurs factors into this one not as much, but a significant amount as well, because after the match, he talked about, like, it, it was an interesting interview. If you read the transcript, uh, you can find it, uh, like, football.london slash Tottenham, blah, 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 blah. But basically, if you Google, like, Pochettino post-match press conference, you'll find it. And he starts off by saying, like, oh, I don't really want to talk about it. Like, it's not a big deal, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then he kind of does the can't contain his annoyance anymore and gets very much into like this is the most unsettled side we've had and like Christian Eriksen like there are other players ahead of him and you probably know more than I do about what's going on with him and kind of all of the hallmarks of frustrated manager who wants the window closed so he knows who he has but also wishes that his players would just kind of stay put and stop getting poached by other clubs it felt like the frustration was there for Pochettino which I have to believe is really frustrating for Spurs fans because this could be a side that, you know, obviously goes deep in the Champions League, could be competing for the title, and it feels right now that, like, things are not where they need to be, and I think that's why Pochettino isn't starting those two players, because he wants mm. everything settled, and it's just not settled right now. Yeah, for sure, and I think we've had a few managers, I think Jurgen Klopp was complaining about the windows not aligning this weekend as well, and I think there's great intentions behind having the window close at the start of the season, but the rest of Europe needs to do it, and I suppose they need to do it at the same time, and I think the, the, the good thing here is we've only got a week left of this nonsense, because it will be all closed uh, by the end of the week, and Neymar will be miserably <laughs> shut in Paris, where he has to keep playing for another season, and Christian Eriksen probably have to stay Miserably shut as well. in Paris. That's, that's, that's a commentary on Neymar's existence, because I, I mean, feel like Paris- there are a lot of people. It's a lovely place, but I it don't is. think he's having a good time there. I suppose he's probably not. Um, mm. Ryan, I want to ask you. That's insane. Sorry. He has so much money and he lives in Paris. How is he not having a good time? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Ryan, I'm going to ask you for complete speculation here, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, that's my specialty. <laughs> all right. So the Christian Eriksen situation especially is one that I find confusing because, again, Pochettino's explanation, the abbreviated one was like, where should I put him? There are other players who played ahead of him. And if they had scored, you wouldn't be asking me about Christian Eriksen, but they didn't. So you are, which is whatever I, I that's a manager doing managerial things i get it my question for you is is this based on the frustration we saw from pochettino is this him sort of saying like i want erickson settled and until i feel like he's settled and definitely focused on our team i'm not gonna play him or is there a chance that this was like hey we might sell christian erickson like somebody from the board basically saying we might sell christian erickson we can't risk him being injured so you can't play him yeah, I'm not. I'm not buying what Pochettino is selling there at all. Because if it if that is the case, if he's not settled, he doesn't want to play him till he's ready and settled. Don't bring him on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> don't bring him on as a game changer to yeah. try and change a game, and don't make it widely acknowledged that he is the ingredient you need. And you know, Spurs in the latter part of this game looked better than they did any any other part of this game. Yep. And there's no, probably no coincidence there. So I mean, in, say, in saying that nonsense about you know you you wouldn't be saying that if the other players ahead of him had scored. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the phrase, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bicycle. So what? <laughs> exactly. 
thank you. <laughs> That's such a better way of explaining it. Thank you for that, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I'll say like like given that Manchester United are going to be uh, you know battling for seventh is my guess this season. What a battle it's Ooh. going to be! Like I'm looking for interesting narratives elsewhere, and I want Tottenham to be very good because I want it to be a three horse race and to be interesting, and they're all kind of stealing points from each other. And yeah. this goes back to my frustration, and I think Pochettino is probably as frustrated about the windows not all lining up. Is that now you do have a squad who are sort of hoping that no one it's like the 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 kid who hasn't studied and is hoping they don't get called on in class like you're just desperately <laughs> hoping you can make it through to the end of the class and then you can go home and make sure that you're caught up on stuff and i think that's where tottenham are right now but it definitely doesn't help uh, get them off to a strong start in my opinion no definitely not not a strong start but as we as we have said the the, the the day is young on the premier league season so we can't make too many rash judgments at this point all the big boys have lost points of course apart from liverpool they're not losing any points nah. um but, yeah, I think there's definitely some unrest. And I think one thing that I've seen several people comment on is the atmosphere at the Tottenham Megaplex, which everybody loves. But it seems like it's almost like they're having a 33-minute protest in there for 90 minutes a lot of the time, it seems. Particularly this one, it seemed like there was a bit devoid of atmosphere. Is, is that what it is? It's solidarity with Portland and Seattle? I think it must be the hipster element of Tottenham having some solidarity with the uh, Cascadian oh. well, brothers. that's good of them. Yes. That's good of them to do. We'll we'll talk more about Portland and Seattle uh, later on. But right now, we're talking about rash decisions and uh, maybe teams not making the most long-term decisions that would maybe benefit them, which feels like a good time to talk about Hims, a new wellness brand for men. They're a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Uh, Hims would like to remind everyone, summertime is here. Still here. Late August, but still here summer. And while you may be breaking out that baseball cap for a day at the beach or the ballpark, if you're wearing it to hide thinning hair, you may not have to worry anymore. Definitely not. Did you know 66% of men lose their hair by age 35? I did not, Ryan. Thank you for telling me. I'm 35. Uh-oh. That's it. Boy, uh, wait, wait. If, if you are 35, does that mean when you're like th- like 36, does that mean you no longer have to worry about it because you've made it past the 66%? Yeah, definitely. You've, cl- you've cleared that benchmark and you're, you're good. Yeah, I'll have hair <laughs> for the rest of my life. I don't know about that. But uh, if, if, I, if I do have a problem with that, Hims is there to help me. Hims mm. connects you. Taylor, with real doctors and medical grade solutions to yes. treat hair loss. Well known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions are there to help you keep your hair. There's no snake oil pills, no gas station counter supplements. Mm-hmm. I'm still intrigued by gas station counter supplements. I don't buy anything from the gas station except gas and maybe chewing gum, but anyway. And uh, they've got prescription solutions here backed by science. No awkward in person doctor visits, all done on four hymns. Dot com. <laughs> First of all, that's some great dot coming, Ryan Bailey. Second of all, <laughs> uh, yeah, like we were talking earlier about like, like we're, we're both, I think I am now 35. Yes, I'm 35. Uh, I should know I these remember. things. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, but it is the case that like I, I see myself every day when I look in the mirror. And so if you look at yourself every single day, you might not notice that it's gradually thinning. That's why maybe you need someone else to remind you of that, but also why you shouldn't be, I'm, I'm saying this mostly to myself that like I know that my inclination would be to be like, it's fine. It's it's fine. It's fine. I don't need to think about it. Like, I'll just bury my head in the sand. What could go wrong? That's mm. not an effective treatment for hair loss, by the way, burying your head in the sand. It's not going to work. Um, but that's where, again, <laughs> I think that's the – what I do appreciate about hymns is they kind of remove the stigma a little bit. They remind us that two-thirds of the population starts to lose their hair by that by that age of 35. It's not that big of a deal, and hymns make, makes it way less of a deal uh, because, as Ryan said, they make it very easy and because they make it easy to save money. Our, our listeners can get a trial month of hymns for just $5 today right now while supplies last see their website for full details and safety information this would cost hundreds if you went to a doctor or a pharmacy would indeed uh t- side note uh, unrelated mm-hmm. how old is andrew luck uh like like physically or how old is he like birth wise is he under 35 i think he is right i'm yeah i think he is he under 30 yeah he's quite young well, he's really he's definitely younger than 35 and yeah, I gotta say he he could he could use some for hymns dot com. He well maybe he'll have the time now. He that will he is, now. He he's will. no longer getting batted around. But I will is... not boo him if he if he types that into his into his search engine. No, frankly. don't boo Andrew Luck. Don't boo no. anybody at all. If anybody says they're retiring because they're in too much physical pain, I don't care if you think that you endured more physical pain. You can still have empathy and apologize and not apologize, but just say like, okay, fine, good career. I hope you get better, man. Enjoy your millions of dollars. 
People are the worst. They are the worst, but Hims is not. So go to <laughs> fourhims.com slash total soccer. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash total soccer. One more time, fourhims.com slash total soccer. Ryan, you mentioned like the big boys in the Premier League were getting off to a fast start. That was mm. not the case for Bayern Munich. They did not get the win in their first week. They made up for that this weekend. Uh, a 3 0 away win at Schalke. Robert Lewandowski with the hat trick. Uh, it did feel to me like, oh, yeah, this is uh, a good reminder that Bayern Munich very, very good because they brought in new boys like Pavard and Hernandez. They started mm. them, but then Coutinho Perisic make their debuts. Did this seem like the game where like the new look Bayern Munich were looking very good, or was this maybe Schalke looking very bad, or maybe both? Uh, maybe a little combination. I'd say I wasn't convinced that new look Bayern is very different from old Bayern. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's still the same formula. Still, I'm still wondering when they're going to rename themselves Lewandowski plus 10, um, because that seems to be the way. <laughs> Certainly against Schalke. He scored in nine successive games against Schalke. He loves scoring against them Gills and Gherkin boys and has totally had, uh, definitely had a great game here. That free kick, by the way, for 2-0. Mm-hmm. Up and down, man. Nice? Up and down. And anytime it hits like perfectly back corner, like not mm. side netting, not like just to the like right of the back corner, but just perfectly in that corner, it looks so much better, especially when it goes up and over the wall. We had a couple in the pre- – Bournemouth scored a beauty like that, oh, didn't yeah. they, as well? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love those kind of free kicks. Lovely stuff. But, yeah, as you say, a, a, a definitely an improved Bayern team. I think Pavar has looked good. We've always seen him so far. And Hernandez getting his, uh, his debut start as well looked pretty impressive. I would say – the one thing about this Bayern team is they get lots of possession, but do they? I know they've scored three goals here, but do they do enough with the possession they get? It sometimes feel like feels like they're a little bit blunt and don't have as many ideas in the final third as I feel like they should. I, I agree, and I think that's why. Like I. Obviously, they have an incredible amount of talent, and you look at their starting 11 of their bench, and you think, like, yep, it's going to be them and Dortmund for the title, for sure, once again. Mm-hmm. But I do take your point as to why you say it's Lewandowski plus 10, because he does feel like the one who just sort of is like, guys, it's not that hard. Just kick the ball into the goal. Just do it. Like, <laughs> like, And there's a lot of – it's not even that Bayern are overly elaborate. It just felt like there were – chances that should have been taken that weren't or chances that should have been put in that were put wide and it just mm-hmm. feels like there's that you don't have that next level kind of predatory finishing ability in a lot of those Bayern players who probably should have it and maybe they will by the end of the season because it is some young players and some wide players who are getting more central opportunities but it did seem like like Robert Lewandowski was the only one to be like no 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 just just kick the ball into the corner and it usually goes in and then we'll be fine. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see uh, Coutinho introduce a little bit more because I'm not convinced by, say, Kingsley Coman in that mm-hmm. position. I think he, he he can look fancy on the ball but doesn't always have a great end product, although, to be fair, he got an assist in this one. So I think the the, the flanks beside Lewandowski could use some work. But Serge Gnabry has been pretty good, to be fair. Yeah. Um, also, I would say that you said, is this, is this about it? Was mm-hmm. this indicative of Schalke being poor? I wouldn't say so because they had quite a few chances. I think they had 11 shots in the end. I think they had a few decent chances to get on the scoreboard here, just that they were overwhelmed by the fact that they were playing the Death Star of the Bundesliga. That's all. I mean, I I agree to some extent, but I would add, though, that like, this felt like this is a Schalke team that were sort of near the relegation zone last season, like closer to it than not is, I guess, the way I'll put that. Oh, yeah, it was a disaster. Yeah, exactly. And so, but it, it felt a little bit like a team that was kind of rebounding from that going up against Bayern Munich and still thinking like, oh no, we're the Schalke team that like makes the Champions League and makes the Champions League knockout round and like, we'll be fine and kind of tried to play this open game where they were trying to close down space but also didn't really play a unified system and to me it felt like they I take your point that they got shooting opportunities and probably could have scored a couple goals themselves but also it felt like they were constantly putting out fires and I think if Byron had been a little bit more efficient a little bit more ruthless this finishes with an even more lopsided scoreline so although Schalke I think were okay it yeah. definitely made me nervous about the way they're going to be playing in these opening couple months because Weston McKinney especially uh, that's one that Daryl and I will probably talk Talk about a little bit more as well on tomorrow's show. He just seemed like he was kind of always putting out fires and always making plays, but not that like, oh, he was in the exact right position to make that play and like, oh, he got that ball and did exactly what he needed to, but more so like, oh, he made that desperation tackle. Oh, he was able to sprint 15 yards and still make that tackle, which all felt sort of last ditch defending more so than like a unified system of defense. Yeah, yeah, he got a shot off in this one as well. I seem to remember, yeah, and I mean, he was he was okay, but I, I think I think basically it couldn't get much worse than last season for Schalke. So this is true. 
they seem to be heading in the right direction from this one game I've watched of theirs this season so far. <laughs> All right, Ryan, I have one more question for you about Bayern Munich, specifically about Robert Lewandowski. As I watched him just very calmly dispatch that penalty and obviously the free kick as well, mm. it, it made me wonder, is he the player that like, if you were picking one player to score a penalty for, for your team, say you could have anybody come in and take a penalty for Wimbledon in a very important game, would it be Robert Lewandowski or is there another active player that you think maybe is even more clinical in front of goal? Uh, apart from myself, I quite like to take one of those uh, uh, get, just to get on the field. But would you? Do you have that? Do you have that mentality of like I want the penalty, I want to take it? No, no, because like okay. when I play rec soccer, I, I've missed a few recently, and uh, I, I, my confidence is shot. Oh no, I, that, I, you hate to hear that, but maybe that's why you got to mm. get back out there. So you'll take the the <laughs> second one. You'll take like you'll go number two in the shootout. But who's going number one for you? Oh, it's Robert Lewandowski. He's number okay. one all the way. He's he's past forty three penalty attempts. He scored forty one. That's a fairly decent record. Fairly and I decent. mean, who, in terms of who are the best penalty takers, he has to be up there. Although Mo Salah, the way mm-hmm. he puts them right in the oh top corner, oh my goodness, that's, that's like perfect as well. I, I love it when you can just put it where the keeper has exactly zero percent possibility of saving it. Well, I kind of forgot how inch perfect that penalty was. All right, yeah. Ryan, I'm sorry, you're number three now. It goes Robert Lewandowski, then Mohamed Salah, then Ryan Bailey in my in my shootout order. I apologize for company. that, but I think it's how it has to be. I'll take it. And I don't know. Um, we, one thing we didn't talk about Man United is mm. the whole penalty uh, ah, yes. <laughs> taking thing. Maybe we should just not talk about that. Uh, I mean, I think you should score your penalties. That that's it's a controversial opinion, Ryan. But I think if you've got a penalty, you should probably try to score it. 12 yards, one-on-one, one Mm -hmm. one kick. Yeah, the odds are in your favor. You're probably right. I feel like that was the like added distraction that would have gotten more attention were it not for all the VAR kind of insanity. But with Pogba missing and maybe like should he have taken it or not against Wolves, then Rashford steps up and he doesn't take it. I yeah. did see some people trying to create the narrative that like Pogba missing his disrupted Rashford's flow. It's it's a whole it's a whole lot. And so yes, I'm gonna say we can leave it there and instead we'll move to Italy. Uh because Italy kicks off this weekend. Uh Juventus get the win. Not surprisingly, it's what they do. But we, mm. Ryan, are gonna focus on Fiorentina Napoli for a moment because there are questionable VAR decisions in this one, as there always are whenever VAR is involved, but more so the ridiculous scoreline. Fiorentina at home, uh three, Napoli four. Uh and I wanna say two things. One, uh Napoli's attack is just super super duper fun. Uh we yeah. had David Amoy on the show to help preview uh, the Serie A season. He was mentioning that Napoli would be a team to watch, that they would be very fun to watch, which is why I wanted to kind of spotlight this game. Uh, and I'm happy I did, because their attack is just so very Liverpoolian in the best possible sense of, like, any one of their attackers or midfielders can score at any given moment, yeah. and and it seems inclined to do so. So I find Napoli really exciting to watch. Ryan, where were they for you? Did you enjoy this one? Or do you have, like, hidden Fiorentina sympathies and thus did not enjoy it? <laughs> no, I very much enjoyed it. Who can't enjoy a seven-goal thriller in Serie A? You don't get those every day. You do not. Um, <laughs> uh, but it just reminded me how much I enjoy watching Dries Mertens play. And, you know, yes. whether it's national team or, yeah. or, for, or for domestically, he's just great, isn't he? He really just, is. Oh, like that, that, the goal for the, the, the equalizing goal, that curl goal, when he had like eight players in front of him. I mean, he didn't have any pressure on him, to be fair, immediately. But oh, just to reel that one off was wonderful. Oh, I, and not just in attack, by the way, Napoli are great because they've mm-hmm. obviously strengthened. They, they got Costas Manolas brought yep. in. And so they, that, that center back pairing of him and Koulibaly makes them that could be the most bulletproof central pairing in, in the league yes. there. Right. Yeah. So I mean, they, they, they very, looked, despite conceding three goals to Fiorentina, that, that center back pairing still looked very, very strong and uh, like they're very capable of doing big things this season. Yeah, I should say they did let Kevin Prince Boateng score a third goal against him, so I should qualify. More on him in a moment. More on him in a moment. (laughs) I'm so excited to talk about him. (laughs) But yeah, um, this was a very exciting watch. And I think Napoli, probably a better shout than Inter to to give Juve a run for their money this season. Mm -hmm. But on on this evidence, they're going to score a lot and maybe concede a few too. Uh, Yes, I would say that is a fair summary. I would also (laughs) add that uh, if people haven't seen anything from this game, uh, try to find, if you're only going to watch one goal, uh, I would say watch the very last goal for Napoli because it's it's very much indicative of how I think they'll be this season, which is basically like Mertens getting them on the left, crossing it to Kaya Hone, who plays a one-touch ball back across for like Insigne to head like unmarked from three yards away from goal but just yeah. these sort of like 
like ping 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 element of the way they played this one and how discombobulated it made the Fiorentina defense uh, was a sight to behold and something I enjoyed. I also really enjoyed uh, Kevin Prince Boateng, uh, as we've already talked about, scoring a goal. That's great. But it just felt so fitting that he goes by Prince now. He has Prince on the back of his jersey. And seeing Prince on the back of an all purple jersey felt very, very oh. fitting to me. It seems like a match made in heaven, uh, which is obviously where Prince is right now, looking down on us and giving us like staring eyes, not smiling. But yes, Bless. Kevin Prince Boateng in purple, a lovely, lovely sight to behold. I didn't even make that link. That's wonderful. Well done. Oh, I try. I try, wonderful Ryan. Stuff. I, I felt and, uh, like that was the thing that you would appreciate. Where are you on Prince? W- would, you go, would you have gone to see Prince? W- were you able to? I never did. But he did like, while I was still in England, he did like a 21 night residency at the O2 in London or something like that. And I wish I'd gone to that because that was supposed to be incredible. So I, um, I do, that's one of my regrets. I never oh. saw him live. Because he's one of, he's, he's like, of all the guitar gods, I've seen lots of the guitar gods play Eric Clapton. I've seen uh, Brian May last week. Mm. He's he's one of the underrated ones because he's so good. So is that are you a, you're a guitar guy? I like it. I like a good guitarist. Sure. And do you play as well? I play. I oh dabble. yeah. Is your avatar you with a guitar? Have yeah. I made that up? Oh, there we go. See. All right. So maybe <laughs> maybe you should reunite with one of the Oasis brothers, and then you can be Oasis too. Oasis, what Mark two? Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one one other thing I wanted to talk. I about. I mean Ryan Gallagher. <laughs> it's perfect. Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yes, oh. I'm sorry. Yes, one I'm more thing. To some prints after this, but the other thing I was going to say is Mr. Frank Ribery mm-hmm. coming in, coming in as a sub. So we've got a, a slightly skewed towards the latter, uh, the autumn years of the career in mm-hmm. terms of Prince Boateng and Ribery up front for uh, for the Fiorentina. That should be interesting. I like uh, Ribery. Seemed to be doing a lot of. If not coaching, then a lot of like adjustments and and like kind of motivational talks on the sideline, which isn't a thing that I usually think of when I think of Frank Ribery. He doesn't strike me as the like most outgoing, uh, like motivational, coachy type player. And I, yeah. I was wondering if like if this is the step he's making that now he's like, okay, I'm getting near the end of it. I want to kind of transition. Maybe I want to end up being a coach, so I'll start using this as an opportunity. But just the way like players would score and go up to him and celebrate with him, but then also get additional consultation and even after goals would go in like defenders would run up and start talking to him it seemed like he's taking on a a more senior leadership role there which uh i'm interested to see if that works for him or not also on that what language is he speaking to them great question <laughs> uh, Fre- french i guess he may he might be one of those who like speaks 17 languages and we just don't know it because he has kind of played all over the place although i believe i'm correct in saying this is his first foray into italy so maybe he speaks uh french with like an italian accent how about that yeah he has played all over the place. Just ask um, those hotel... Oh, I, I won't go into that. Sorry. <laughs> Let's just move quickly along. Uh, one more game uh, specifically we want to talk about, then a more general question at the end. But let's mm-hmm. talk Portland-Seattle. Uh, Portland won at home, Seattle 2. Uh, Seattle with the win. Uh, but this game, I think, kind of made like bigger headlines uh, because of the first 33 minutes of this game in which the Timber supporters remained essentially silent. Uh, Ryan, uh, what did you make of their protest? It was... It was interesting to me, and I have reasons for why it was interesting, but I'm wondering where you were on it. I think it's very interesting because obviously there was the first 33 minutes of, of this um, um, game. They decided to do the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium experience, um, <laughs> kept, kept things very quiet. And, Is that what it was? Uh, <laughs> I think that's what they called so it. So Tottenham were showing solidarity with them, and they were trying to give everybody the uh, organic Tottenham experience. That's how it that's was? That's right. That's Perfect. exactly what it was. Perfect. But in all seriousness, they would, you know, obviously there's this been this missive from MLS about um, no political flags anywhere. And obviously the Iron Front flag is something that's big uh, for, for Portland fans and for many other fans, actually. You've seen them, I saw them at Cincinnati this weekend as well, for example. And this is kind of a stand against it because, you know, you should, you know, FIFA have a no to racism campaign. Mm-hmm. And are you going to call that political? I mean, you could call the American flag political. You I could. could go on. You could call the pride stuff in uh, various stadiums or political as well. So, so I think it's a pretty good cause that they were doing this for. Um, I mean, did you think on, on the coverage, though, did it sound mm-hmm. like it was it didn't sound like it was deadly silent to me? So that, that's what I found really, really interesting, um, because I think it was John Champion and Taylor Twelman, I believe, were your commentators for this one. And John Champion, I think, had a pre-scripted message to explain what was happening that mm. did a I'm going to see an interesting job of walking a line of saying like, well, that won't and that won't be allowed anymore. The flying of the iron flag, but then adding like or not iron flag. <laughs> That's the ironborn from uh, Game of Thrones, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but like the iron cross is a very different thing, too. 
<laughs> yes, very true, very true. But he did the, like, it won't be allowed, but, like, you know, and that's a bad thing, but a good thing, depending on your perspective. And we'll see, and so there's going to be a protest. But maybe there won't be, but there yeah. could be. And if there is, we'll see what happens. Like, he was trying really hard to explain the situation without really saying anything. Um, but so when it began, I think with that kind of prelude, I did find myself thinking, like, eh, it, it is kind of loud in there. But then yeah. what I what – I, if you go back and listen – you can hear the players really, really clearly. Mm. And I think this was an intentional effort to amplify the volume anywhere where there was noise to make it seem like there was kind of a, a more like, oh, it's just a few angry fans who aren't doing it. Everybody else is cheering. And what I found hilarious is that they would do that, but then when players would come close and be really loud because the mic volume was way up, they had to drop it really, really quickly. Yeah. And so there were these sort of unequal times when it would be like – like, like, ah! and it's just be like, ah, turn it down, turn it down, turn it down. Like, it was really quickly, like, oh, oh no, gosh. that doesn't work. And so... Make that oh, noise again. Make that noise again. Ah! <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, that was lovely. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so yeah. I, it but did seem the, like the, they were trying to cover that one just a little bit. Yeah, definitely some TV trickery from the director there, I'd say. I think the most intriguing thing about the whole aspect of this is it's kind of the players, club, and supporters mm-hmm. openly sort of going against MLS. It's like, yep. it's kind of like, you know the son going against his dad, isn't it really? Mm-hmm. Cause it's not like, it's not like a, a, a premier league club going against the premier league, uh, uh, front desk or front office. It's, it's quite different with the relationship that a club yeah. has to, to MLS in general. So it's even like, with, it's like the even son with, going against the dad. If the dad employs the son. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the tweets that, um, Portland's, I think a few others sent out that said bigger than a rivalry, we stand together against fascism, racism. That's kind of flouting MLS's yep. rule in their face, isn't it? Which mm-hmm. I think is very interesting for a club to do in this, in this league. Yes. I mean, yeah. And, and I think the, the players themselves, as you said, also played a role. The, uh, the pre-match like pendants uh, or, or uh, penance that they had, definitely taking a strong stand there. The players standing together for the pre-match photo. I think that was, uh, that was all definitely meant with an eye towards uh, sort of showing their solidarity with the fans. We should also add, yeah. just in case people are curious why it was 33 minutes, uh, because the Nazi regime banned that flag in 1933, which is why they went with the 33rd minute here as a show of sort of like you all are banning us look who else banned like the flying of this flag uh not like, a strong a strong statement i will say from the supporters my one other mo- thing i wanted to add about this one was i don't know if this was just coincidental but it feels like a really strong coincidence if it were is that uh about a minute before the protest was uh protest was scheduled to end the scoreboard cut away so there was no more like graphic of the score or the minutes and only af- like about 30 seconds after like normal kind of crowd noise had been restored did that clock come back up. And that felt like a very strange time to drop it away almost as if they were saying like we don't want people to note that and the exact 33rd minute is when all the noise came back. Oh, that's cynical, isn't it? That's a little so bit. cynical. Now, maybe you know, maybe that was just a production thing. Maybe that was just only on the like ESPN Plus feed, but that is definitely how it looked to me. So mm. that's how I'm taking it. One thing I would complain about this game, it has nothing to do with the protests, mm-hmm. it's the kits. Why are but, they both playing in green? That's outrageous. Excellent question. John Champion also did not enjoy that. He seemed more, like, confused and frustrated by that than being forced to sort of, like, talk about a difficult thing in an awkward way. But, yeah, dark green versus, like, uh, rave green, as I believe it's called, they, they had to get, I think, special uh, approval from the league to both play in that. But it... When you're playing what? green versus green on green, not a great look with green all around you. It it definitely didn't make for the most yeah like aesthetically pleasing look. No, not not great at all. Not great. I already have trouble identifying two of Arsenal's players who look identical. I had to identify <laughs> twenty two people who looked identical in this one. Uh, you're not the only one. Wasn't there a ref who sent off the wrong Arsenal player a couple years ago? I think it was Kieran Gibbs got sent off when he didn't do anything wrong. Or there was maybe a good time um, back, in, back in the day with Wimbledon when we were in the Premier League. The opening day of the season, we beat Liverpool on the opening day. I think it was 97, because 96 was the first day of the season when David Beckham scored his lob from 50 yards. Um, it was a season where every Wimbledon player shaved their heads. We had players like Vinnie Jones and all, all those guys. And um, Andy Thorne, one of the fullbacks, got sent off but it was actually Vinnie Jones's foul so that he had to, like five minutes later came back out the tunnel and Vinnie Jones went off wait Vinnie Jones fouled somebody yeah I know it's, it's shocking I know the but devil because you they say all, they all had identical haircuts the referee got confused 
All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> well done, Vinnie <laughs> Jones, I guess. Or Wimbledon, maybe not. But definitely well done, Portland. Well done, Seattle. Seattle with the win. As we said, uh, more MLS uh, to be discussed by me and Daryl later on in the week. But right now, Ryan, uh, one more parting question for you, then some scouting. This one comes from Julianne uh, Schiff. I apologize again if I butchered that one. There's a Z in there. I get confused. Julian asks, which big five league winner from last year is going to have the biggest title hangover? All have dropped points already. Hashtag root for chaos. Uh, your options would be Man City, Bayern, Barcelona, Juventus, or PSG. Oh, boy. That's a really difficult question. I love the hashtag root for chaos. Mm-hmm. My initial reaction there is to say Barcelona because I feel like the other four and nailed on to win their leagues, whereas Barcelona <laughs> are not nailed on to win their leagues. Is that fair? Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's yes. I think it's fair when it comes to PSG for sure, because even though I think they are the ones who have the most like turbulence and confusion and what's going to happen with Neymar and, and winning league on at this point seems like a foregone conclusion for them. So you could have some thought that maybe they'll just kind of slip up and not care and lose the title. But just how much money they have and how ludicrous that proposition would be, I think even if they're super dysfunctional, they still find a way to win. I think yeah. Man City, the the outlier there would be like maybe Liverpool find a way to beat them. But even then, that's not necessarily a hangover. It's more that just another very good team was able to finish ahead of them. But I doubt City – there's no way City finished third this season is I guess what I mean to say, which leaves it to Bayern, Barcelona, or Juventus. Bayern, again, maybe semantics, but like kind of knowing where they're coming from and how much change had to happen it feels like a hangover is impossible because like if you're like if you're drinking the night like like in the night with the idea of like yeah this isn't gonna work we got to change things that even if you wake up with a hangover it's more of a like you wake up with a hangover knowing that like life needs to be changed and i think that's where Bayern are so then it yeah. comes down to barcelona and juventus juventus have all the money in the world and all the players whereas barcelona brought in players but maybe they have a little bit of confusion maybe real madrid a resurgent maybe atletico madrid do some things so maybe it is barcelona that's not where i thought i would go with this one but you may have talked me into it and maybe i talked myself into it a little bit as well I think I think my answer to this question is no one's going to have a really bad hangover, but yeah. maybe Barcelona have had like two white claws and they feel a little bit rough for work the next day. <laughs> Which is a good reminder, as always, don't drink white claws. <laughs> Dr- drink your oh. drink your tall boy light beer. I thought you were cool, Taylor. Come on. I mean, I'm not. You, you're the one who like drinks cool things and goes to all the performances while I, I just sit here cynically. I, I, I wouldn't say going to see Queen is cool, but sure. Queen is going to see Queen is definitely cool. Come on, yeah, now. yeah, okay. I, I think so. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, they're <laughs> a seminal rock band who I think most people still listen to and enjoy. Yeah, I, I think I think you're pretty cool, Ryan Bailey. Oh, thanks. I mean, no oh, big deal. Whatever. I don't even care. Remind care. me to FaceTime you when I'm doing my next jigsaw puzzle. Ooh, all right, <laughs> and. Never mind, hard pass on that. But Ryan, (laughs) let's talk uh, for the final segment of today's show. Let's talk the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. For those who are new to the show or don't know what the Scouting Network is, if you choose to support the show, which you can do uh, monthly, ranging from $5 to $25, at any level, uh, we will assign you a young player to keep an eye on. Uh, Unless you don't want one, in which case you can be a silent scout, then you don't have to do anything. But the Scouting Network is a way for people who want to follow a specific player or team or a league or just get into soccer or find a new way to support a new team. We like to think of it as a way to do that. And we then get reports on these young players, which we then read out on the show. Uh, We'll do so today, starting with Andrew Baird. Ryan, can you get us going? Certainly. Andrew Baird is scouting Josh Perez, a 21-year-old American winger for Lafka. Oh, LAFC. Sorry. Lafka. Lafka, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. the team that Zlatan likes to dunk on. Josh Perez scored his first MLS goal last Wednesday in a 4-0 win over San Jose. Perez scored the game's fourth and final goal, receiving a pass inside the box, beating a defender off the dribble, and then confidently hitting a near-post shot past the keeper from six yards out. Not bad, not bad. Uh, this this report came in uh, before El Trafico, so we'll see if we get a Josh Perez yeah. report uh, from El Trafico. Uh, David Majewski scouting Shaq Moore, the 22-year-old American right back for Tenerife. Uh, it is indeed. Uh, in late July, Moore moved from Segunda Division B side Atletico Levante to La Liga 2 side CD Tenerife. He's been on the bench for the Canary Islands-based club for the first two matches of the season. Wow. Have you ever been to Tenerife? It's wonderful. I have not. I, I, I've never been to Spain, in fact. I should probably rectify that. It's, a, it's an island, which is, I think, I think it's closer to Africa than Spain, but it's really good. It's got I, a very, yeah, very trashy strip right. on it, which I went to when I was 18 with all my friends. Anyway, different story. Ooh, right. Todd Brennan. We're learning things about name. Ryan Bailey today. Puzzles and uh, Tenerife. <laughs> 
Todd Brennan, and he's scouting Cameron Carter Vickers. Two wonderful names there, I'd say. 21-year-old American defender, as we know, on loan at Stoke from Spurs. Uh, Cameron Carter Vickers started in last week's 1-0 League Cup win over Wigan Athletic. Oh, that's a northern game, isn't it? Stoke and Wigan, oh boy. And then started again in the middle of a five-man back line over the oh, weekend. God. In a championship matchup against Leeds. No, so northern. He was subbed off in the 73rd minute of an eventual 3 0 loss. Stoke remain winless on the season and are currently bottom of the table with one point and minus eight goal difference. Wonderful. The tabloid fires have started to burn around manager Nathan Jones, who was appointed in January of last season and is 4 11 19 over that period. Yikes. Yeah, not great. That is an incredibly northern scouting report. Well done, Ryan Bailey. Well done, Todd. Uh, Michael Fisk scouting Andreas Christensen, the 23-year-old Danish center back for Chelsea. Uh, the good news is that Andreas has played all three Premier League matches this season after riding the bench last year. The bad news is that Norwich City were able to pass around him for their first goal and kept Pookie on side for Norwich's second goal. Uh, obviously, this report as well coming uh, before Chelsea got their win, so they can feel a little bit better about things right now, potentially. Absolutely. Todd Ito <laughs> scouting Takafusa Kubo, the 18-year-old Japanese attacker on loan at Real Mallorca from Real Madrid. Ooh. After reportedly rejecting a move to Real Valladolid, I can't keep this up, <laughs> young Take is going to keep on loan to Real Mallorca for the season. Todd thinks this move reflects Real Madrid's confidence in Take's abilities. Given that he'll be playing in the Liga rather than against a bunch of scrubs in third-tier Spanish football, it's interesting how Zidane's taking some, uh, making some moves here, isn't it? Including, I think, bringing his son back. But the Takafusa Kubo one, probably slightly more relevant given that he's a youngster who could have an impact down the road. We'll see. Uh, Philip Andreani scouting uh, Andre Green, the 21-year-old English winger on loan at Preston from Villa. Uh, Green scored on his Preston debut in the Carabao Cup uh, match against Bradford. He then came on in the 26th minute of Preston's match against Swansea, replacing the injured uh, Luis Molt up front uh, as a central forward. I feel like I may have made that French in Louis, maybe Luis, and I don't really know these things. The experiment of playing Green in the center as opposed to on the wing didn't really lead to anything and Preston end up losing 3-2 fans didn't seem too happy with the move considering there were other striking options on the bench Cole Burgess is scouting Steven Bergwin. He's a 20-year-old Dutch winger for PSV, Schmock and a pancake. Bergwin <laughs> recorded his first goal of the season in a 2-0 win against Heracles. Bergwin has, a, has played as a central attacking midfielder in two of the three Eredivisie matches this season. This is a notable difference from last season where he played every match on the wing. Notable differences. Ryan, you seem like a fellow who's traveled all over the place. Do you, when you've spent some time in a country, do you end up doing that thing where you pick up a little bit of the accent? Like, if you were in the Netherlands, would you start doing that sort of Steve McLaren Steve thing? McLaren. Mm. Well, you know what? I've been in these here in the United States for eight years now, Whoa. so I think you're right. That was real close. That was really close. <laughs> you, you, you hit some words in there with that southern accent that were really, really close to sounding like you're from North I just, Carolina. I just well done, to do sir. my Kenny Powers is what I work on. <laughs> uh, this show tends to be clean, so please don't do too accurate of a Kenny Powers impression. <laughs> Understood. But Daryl steadfastly refuses to do an American accent and also doesn't really appreciate when people try to do his accent. Uh, so I appreciate your willingness to practice the, the Southern draw. Well done, sir. You have to, because if you if I like go to like a McDonald's or a somewhere and try mm -hmm. and order in this accent, they, I have to ask three times. What do you like? Say you, you want just like the, the liquid that comes out of the tap. Do you say your accented version of that? Or do you say the Americanized like water? Ice water. Can I get an ice water? Oh, you see, make a, a little jersey. I feel like there's yeah. a little jersey in there. Hey, I'm ice water in here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now we got to move on real fast. <laughs> Things have happened that can't be undone. <laughs> Dylan Veach scouting Kai Havertz, the 20-year-old German midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Leverkusen opened the season with a 3-2 win over Paderborn this weekend. Kai opened the season with a goal in the 19th minute. He collected a driven pass at the top of the box, calmly had a perfect turn, and chipped it over a charging keeper into the far side netting. He also provided an, an MLS assist, which is the official term, uh, floating inside from the right wing as he did throughout the game finding his left back wide open on the other side of the box, who then crossed it in for the winner. Lovely stuff. One last one for you, Tay Tay. Andy Hollum's just reminding us all that Julian Green still exists. Yeah, he the does. 24-year-old American forward for Greuterfurt at the moment. Ooh. Green scored the only goal in Greuterfurt's 1-0 win over Jan Regensburg in the Zweite Bundesliga. Green beat the keeper on a nice header in the 74th minute to give him two goals in the first three matches of the season. That is very impressive. Ryan Bailey's ability to switch from southern accent to perfectly uh, pronounced German is especially impressive. Well done, Mr. Bailey. Well done, sir. I try. I try.
I mean, I appreciate your effort, and I appreciate you making the effort to talk about all the games we've talked about this weekend, and I look forward to doing the same with you next weekend. But, Ryan, right now, I suppose we'll bring it to a close. I want you to be able to enjoy your uh, first day with no children uh, running around screaming at home. Are you just going to go, like, sit in silence for a while and enjoy the silence? I'm going to Depeche Mode and feel the silence, baby. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very musical episode of the Total Soccer Show, and I dig it because I dig Depeche Mode. So, Ryan Bailey, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Always a pleasure, never a chore.